Hey, everybody. Uh, it's good to be hanging out with you today. So I got a question for you. Have you ever wondered when is my partner, my spouse, going to stop talking about the same pain over and over again? When is she going to stop bringing it up so we can move on in our journey, in our healing? So we're going to talk about that today. Welcome to Beyond the Facade podcast. I'm your host, Luke Gordon, and I'm thrilled to have you join me in this space today. What we're going to be doing is diving deep into the trials and triumphs and truths of seeking authenticity. Becoming your true self isn't about a single action or a moment. It's a relentless pursuit, a commitment to self that reveals the rich connection and meaning that our life has to offer. So whether this is your first time tuning in or you're a regular listener, know this. What you're building here goes beyond a conversation. You're here to challenge, to change, and to celebrate the incredible journey of becoming your authentic self. Because when you dare to show up fully, the rewards are immeasurable. So welcome to Beyond the Facade. Let's get started. I am excited to have Sai. Embarrassing story. I already had Sai do one podcast with me. We were just talking about this. And I had to tell him that I was a little bit embarrassed because that podcast is no longer around. So... That one is void and gone. Sai, do you, how do you feel about being here recording a second podcast? Do you hope this one will actually go through? Yeah, yeah. The most technology savvy person, I know it's okay to make mistakes because the most technology savvy person I, I know deleted a podcast already. So we're good. I feel like I'm not lonely on this topic because I am not technology savvy. So we're good. I appreciate you being back today. Even though this is the first time our listeners are going to get a chance to hear you. But even though it's the second time you recorded a podcast with me. So thank you. Yeah. Me. I appreciate it. Of course. So Sai and I are going to talk about a topic today that comes up all the time in our groups. It's really just a big lion's share of the work. You're going through your journey and you feel like your partner has said to you, your spouse, you're shooting up another over and over again. She keeps bringing up the pain. She keeps bringing up the same thing. And you are just exhausted. You're just tired. And a lot of men start to say, when are we going to talk about something different or when are we going to move on in our journey? So that's really what we're going to talk about today. In or or what, they also say, why is she not getting over this already? Like, thank you. Why is she not getting over this today? They've well, already. been over this a million times, right? Like, it should already be over this. And yeah, just had to add that part in. And there is a legit fear that it's not going to change, that she's always going to be in that same amount of pain. And it's valid. I want to validate that. That's what it feels like. When will it get better? I'd like to throw back at you if you're thinking that and you're experiencing that. Why is she? Why is she in that same pain? Why is she bringing something up over and over again? Hey, Sai, since you've been around these guys a long time, what do you think they'd be responding if we had a group of them today? Why is she? Why are we still here? Well, a few things out here. She... She just can't let go. Women just can't let go of things. And so it's always going to be that way. Another one that is frequent is I'm a piece of crap and I just keep triggering her and she just won't let it go because she hates me. There's a lot of different reasons why they bring it up, but those are some of the more common ones I hear. Another one that came to mind is she wants to remind me of what I've done and she wants to... They don't say this like she wants to hurt me. She wants me to be in pain, but that's what it feels like. Mm. She's wanting me to experience the same kind of pain she's experiencing. Yeah. She doesn't want me to forget sometimes, and that, mm -hmm. that might be the case too. There's kind of some truth to the, these things, but I want to share with you something that I do in group. And it's really funny because one thing that we know is that men really, really like to fix things. That's where they get a lot of their value. Sai's heard this story again, and Sai, I'm going to pull you into it. But when we talk about why a partner's still in pain and why they aren't getting over it, for lack of a better way to say it, is I hear this thing about this time my son, who was 18 at the time, had been saving up summer after summer to get a new car or to get his first car. And he'd worked so hard summer after summer. And we were on vacation in, in Florida. And He'd found the car and I only said two things to him. I said, well, I probably said more. He said, try, hey, dude, try to find something with low miles and find something that's not really, really old. And he's like, okay, how really old and how many high miles? So I, I gave him numbers for both. And he, of course, he wants the coolest looking car ever. 
So he'd find something like barely under the miles and barely under the age. And he found it. And good for him. And he says, hey, dad, I found it. And do you mind if I fly home a couple days early? Because I'd like to go get it. And I thought to myself, it's uncomfortable because I won't be there to help. And I said, well, it's your money. You've been saving up. Sure, go ahead. And I gave him some tips and some pointers. And one of the things that I said is I said, I'll make sure that you get a mechanic to meet you out there. Make sure the car's in good shape. Side, so you have a bunch of things going through your mind as far as what you do to prepare a son for this? I, yeah, I just have a bunch of things going through my head. Like I, I would be listing off all these check marks, but I know your story, so free to keep going. So I'm uh, going through this and I'm watching share this with guys as we go through group and there you can see their eyes are getting great big as I tell the story. So here's the rest of the story. He flies home, he goes, he gets the car, grabs the mechanic. The mechanic says, Hey, it's good. He drives the car home. I get home and we go for a ride in the car and it's a, it's definitely a teenager's car. And I'm like, Hey dude, this thing is a magnet for a ticket. So make sure you get this thing registered. And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I will. I will. So a few days goes by and I notice he hasn't got it registered yet. And I go, Hey dude, make sure you get the car registered. Like you're going to, you can't drive that thing unless it's registered and insured and all that kind of stuff. And he gets to a place where another couple of days goes by and then we're sitting in the kitchen, his mom and, and I, and he, he was there and he said, dude, you gotta get that car registered. You seriously can't drive it. And I know you really want to. And he said, yeah, I just, I gotta get the title from the guy. Like what? Uh, and the car cost a lot of money in cash. And I text his mom and I said, oh my gosh. He doesn't have a title to this car. He's got a car in the driveway. It's not even his. And oh my gosh, what's going to happen here? So Cy, I end the conversation there in a group setting. Do you, mm -hmm. you have any idea? I say, oh, this is what I say to the guys. I say, okay, guys, if you're my friend and I'm telling you the story, how do you respond to me? Do you have any guesses on how people respond? What's funny is I've seen the responses because I oh, think I was, in, I was in the first group you shared this. Okay. With, actually, the, the responses were like, I would be like grabbing him, walk him out the door, take him to the guy sitting down like, hey, we even need our money back or you're giving us a title right now. And there's just a bunch of like, you idiot, all this kind of stuff. So yeah, a lot of men just diving into either fix it, call your son an idiot and all this kind of stuff. It was an awesome reaction. We literally start this conversation with, hey, we're going to talk about creating space, holding space, hearing other people's pain. And, and these guys aren't even around their partners or their spouses. They're just around me. And they're like in fix it mode, hardcore side. Mm -hmm. you, what you thought the first time going through this. I was really curious because I was a mentor in the group, right? I was really curious where this was going because we hadn't really discussed your plan for the lesson. So I was sitting back listening and I would have been, my initial thoughts were like, Wow, I would have done the same thing if I was him in that same situation. Cool, cool. So you could relate. I was yeah. sitting there. Two major themes came up, and you you referenced them both. One was guy said, "What the heck, Luke? Seriously, you let that happen? You yep. let your son do it?" And the other one was, "Is let's go find this guy." Actually, the other one say, "Hey, Luke, can you finish the story? Like, what happened next?" And if I don't yeah. go there, they're like, "Hey, can we? Can I help you take care of this?" So you're right. So I like fix it mode, whatever. And then I go, okay, guys, so what are we talking about today? And I don't remember exactly how I went about it, Sai, for that little time you were there, but it was like, what are we talking about today? We're talking about providing empathy. We're talking about empathy. We're talking about providing space for somebody else's large emotions. And they're like, what, do I have, what the heck does this have to do with this? What do you mean providing space for somebody else's large emotions? So I said, thinking about that, how would you guys respond with that? And then it take, they just stumble over it for a while. And then finally, somewhere along the way, one of them says something like, and Sai, help me out here if you can remember some other responses. Somewhere along the way, somebody says, if you're my friend and you're saying this, I would say something like this, how are you doing? And then the best ones, they finally get to, so Luke, you're sitting there in the kitchen and he doesn't have it, doesn't have the title. What was that like for you? And every single time after telling this over and over again, I get a visceral response to what I didn't tell you was I felt like a pile of crap. The moment that I found out 
he didn't have the title. Sure, I text his mom saying, are you kidding me? He doesn't have the title. Underneath it, Shane. Like, you're the crappiest dad ever. You let your take your son have summer after summer of saving all the cash, all the money, and you can't even help him succeed in this. What do you think about that? So, Luke, the thing that comes to mind is the amazing thing behind it. You had to stumble along. Someone finally asked or didn't. No one actually asked you, how did you feel in that moment? I, they didn't even ask you how you felt. But there mm -hmm. was, so what did you actually do? They were wondering how it turned out, right? And they were wanting to know the end of the story or what they could do to fix it. Not one of them asked you, how did you feel in that moment as a dad, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that is one thing natural for a man to do is just to be like, man, don't even go to the emotional part of things. Yeah. yeah. And I want to talk about it. I think with a lot of the men on that call, there was a lot of discomfort because I, I shared a lot of emotion in that. I shared my son and how he'd saved and all the things and what men were processing in that moment was, oh, wait, wait, what's my job here? What is my responsibility? And I said, I was having a ton of shame. So mm -hmm. if you're my friend and you're sitting with me, the moment somebody, even if it was kind of fake, because they knew what the right answer was to say, hey, Luke, what was that like for you? That felt really good. Really, really good. And I recognize when you say, what did you experience? I'm ready to share with you. If I deem you as somebody that can hear me, well, yeah, let me tell you how much I felt like I felt. And so to tie this back in, this is what our partners are experiencing in the fact of, I'm not even coming close to recognizing what my responsibility is here. I have one responsibility, and this is a tool that we want to share with you today. Tool we go through in groups often. It's called C-A-V-R. Getting curious, acknowledging, validating, and reassuring. Cy, what does getting curious mean? Do you mind throwing that one out to people. That is my, for one of my favorite things to talk about actually and help men with I'm getting curious to throw that out there is for me, I rephrase it as giving space for them to share their experience and how they actually see things and seeking understanding because without getting curious, how do you know what you're acknowledging? Without getting curious, how do you know what you're validating? And if you're just going straight to acknowledging, validating, you're really just minimizing their experience and you're probably not acknowledging or validating the right thing or reassuring her on what she really needs to be reassured on or your partner needs mm -hmm. to be reassured on. So getting curious is given space, but also seeking to understand your partner's experience and what they are going through. That's without the curiosity, AVR is used more just as a tool to get out of the conversation rather than actually use it for what it's worth. Okay. So good. Yeah, there is that tool because everybody in that group thought they knew what I was experiencing or thought they knew what I needed. But the moment I said, I felt like a pile of crap, everybody's facial expressions change. They're like, oh my gosh, like fixing it, fixing it. Like, how do I, I don't know. Yeah, like, how do I give space for shame? I don't even want to go to what shame feels like because I know what shame feels like and I want to get away from that. Their face was like, I don't want to even dive into that. So for me, it feels good every single time when I said, I felt like a pile of crap and somebody's brave enough to say, what was that like? Or what was going through your head? I'm like, thank you. Thank you. And this hurts to talk about, but if you can be that safe with me. So Sai, when you think about getting curious with your spouse or watching other men get curious, what do you feel like those men have in common when it comes to just getting curious about what their partner's experiencing. Fear of what their partner is actually experiencing, fear of what she's going to say, fear of what it means about them. I'm scared to even go there, I had to give that space. There's a big one. I'm forgetting what it is. Scared to know what it means about them it is a big one that keeps coming up in mind. There's one more I'm trying to think of, but it's slipped in my brain at the moment. What do you think they have in common when they actually can get curious? The men that do get curious. One thing I would say they have in common myself is that when they do get curious, they have a really good connection with their spouse or partner. 
don't know why or how it happens, but it's actually a very intimate connecting opportunity. And I have yet to see someone who gets curious, who, even though at the moment may seem like it didn't do any good, but eventually their relationship grows because they got curious. Can you give me an example of something you've experienced or you've heard of somebody experiencing that I can get curious about so we can see what this sounds like? Share some pain, Ooh, an example of what pain would look like. And let me see if I can attempt to get curious. So I have this bad habit of going out to eat at fast food restaurants. Like I would pull out money through an ATM. So my wife wouldn't know I was spending money at Whataburger or Wendy's or something like that. And I'd go out and get me a two cheeseburgers, a large fry and a soda. And because one thing about me being fat, I get a lot of shame. I used to weigh a lot of weight, but I really loved going out to eat fast food. And I was afraid to share that with my wife because I would bring a lot of shame for one. I'm not inviting her to go out to eat. So I felt like crap was including her. Then I was spending money. We we're trying to save for a house. And then on top of that, she's at home with the kids, homeschooling, making food, and I'm just going out to eat. So I had a lot of shame around it. I didn't want to share it with her. And when she found out by a receipt in my car, it was like, holy crap, I feel like crap. And then I tried to dismiss it many times and she kept bringing it up. Do you want me to get curious or do you want to get curious on this one? If we put you back in the, the situation. I'll be curious. All right. So she tells you what, and how would you respond with curiosity? I would say, so if I think back to the moment, like, are you really going out to buy food without actually telling me or talking about it? And first off, I'd be like, I have been, yes. How do you feel about that? Oh, sigh. Like you saying, how do you feel about that? What happens in your mind about asking that question? I feel like I'm going to get attacked with the sledgehammer on top of my head. So yeah. the amount of vulnerability that exists in that moment when she's in a triggered state and you say, what is that like for you? How do you feel about that? really important for individual and relational healing to be able to give that kind of vulnerability. That's a lot of strength. So you're saying that feels like I'm just setting myself up for a lot of hurt. A lot of pain coming my way, especially from my wife, who knows what she's going to say, especially when it's the first time uh, it happened a couple of times. I apparently don't learn very fast, but the experience happened a few times. One time I even brought it up and talked about it because we were talking about a different situation, but it still brought up the same visceral response for her. Like, what do you mean you're going out spending money and not working towards our goal together? I thought we were in this together. So there's some betrayal that comes up in that and left out, not important and things that I didn't even think would come out. I didn't think anything about betrayal, but wow, you're literally going out spending money without actually discussing it. It's not that I couldn't go out to eat, but I just thought I needed to hide it. What I hear you saying, and if I'm drawing a dot between two lines that don't exist, just set me straight. What you're saying is if you get curious, you would learn that even though it's food, it's still tied into betrayal. She still feels like it's betrayal. Yeah. But it's still betrayal for her. Yeah. Supposed to be working together as a partnership and work, working towards the same goal. And I'm not keeping my side of the commitment. So just to the people listening today, getting curious is a lot of work. If you think about, again, I'll just give you the acronym CAVR. Some of the guys call it caviar. It's funny. C curiosity. I get curious about what my partner's experience and I don't assume I know what the source of their pain is, what's actually going on. Then you have acknowledge and you acknowledge that your past is their present. So you go, whatever you're experiencing, I recognize that my past choices is affecting you right now, but what I've done in the past is showing up right now. And then you have the validating whatever that emotion is. So that emotion is betrayal. That makes a lot of sense because I go to Waterburger and I don't tell you about it. But that is lying, that is secrecy, and that is that feel of betrayal. That's real. And then there's the R, which is the reassurance that you're committed to the relationship and you're committed to the process of healing and that you're not so, going anywhere. 
Yeah, I, I love that. And so just to walk it through, I know you walked it through a little bit, but I'm going to add a little bit to it, right? Because I think the curiosity part actually should be in between each one of them. Okay. And that's how I teach my guys is I did do that. Yes. How do you feel? I feel betrayed. I'm just going to keep it short on the partner side. I feel betrayed. I hear you saying, and I want to make sure I got this right. You feel betrayed. What about it makes you feel betrayed? Right. No. Giving more space and digging in. All right. So it totally makes sense that you would feel betrayed because I can see from what you said that that's it. Is there anything else along that line that makes you feel more betrayed or any other feeling could come up around that? Talking about giving more space, asking questions after the A until she's no, that, that's literally all that I feel, right? Because she might have also been feeling hurt, insignificant. And if you didn't ask questions after acknowledging what she felt, you wouldn't know everything to validate. Is there anything else that you were feeling at this moment goes a long ways? And then, okay, so totally makes sense. I appreciate you sharing all that. And it totally makes sense that you would feel betrayed, insignificant, because you weren't included in the decision to go out to buy food. Am I getting that right still? Yeah. Nothing else is coming up, right? All right. Not the right part, but is there anything else coming up as I was sharing that? She either says yes or no. She says yes. That's more opportunity to give more space rather than trying to cut it short. And then as you go into the reassure, enough, I think you hit it right on the nail with the reassure. I want to reassure you. I'm still in the process. Say you're saving for a house. I'm still committed to saving for the house. Still committed to including you in as a partner. Notice he's not reassuring her that he's never going to go out to eat again. Right? Cause that's not the problem. The problem wasn't going out to eat. The problem was not including her in the decision, not keeping her as a level partner in the relationship. So you got to also make sure you're reassuring on the right topic. So that's just my two takes. And then after I reassure more curiosity. Is there anything else coming up that you'd like to talk about? So that's good. That I love that. And because that's what I was, I don't do it that way, Cy. And I like that a lot because the thing I always try to remember myself is I've got to go like five levels deep on curiosity. Every time I think I understand what the source of the pain is, I got to go a little deeper. So I love that you continue going deeper through the experience. And by the way, just to give a little bit of credit where it's due is the AVR is by Carol Jorgensen Sheets, Acknowledge, Validate, Respond. So this curiosity part I got from Alana, which is don't, would you know this? I don't get curious. Don't start to acknowledge and validate and reassure until you actually know what you're talking about or what your partner's experiencing. So I love that. Absolutely. It becomes a way to push a topic away, which usually leaves your wife or partner feeling like that did absolutely no good. She brings up like, Hey, you went out to eat. I'm sorry. And you tried to just use that as a frame of reference to be like, Hey, let's be done with the conversation rather than opening up the conversation. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So we're not spending a lot of time today talking about the acknowledge, validate, or reassure. It's the getting curious. Um, getting curious. And so I'll, I'll just yeah. put a plug in with this in dopamine nation. I don't know if you caught this when you read it, Luke, but the curiosity, the part at the beginning where I was accountable to what I did, empathy without accountability to me is manipulation. So without yeah. that accountability of yes. what actually, what you actually did, hey, if you go through the whole AVR process and you're not accountable for what you do, you're just manipulating your wife to think, lost. Hey, he's good. I didn't catch right? that. I didn't catch that in that book. Dopamine. Oh. And I didn't catch that. Thank you. You're welcome. Fantastic book, but it added, added another level to the CAVR for me. If you don't have accountability throughout it, uh, for the things you did, not for who you are or what you think it means about you, but for what you did. So I got this one from Kim Brown from choose. I don't know if it's hers or not. But she gives me a statement that I really, really love when it comes to this stuff. And she says, your partner sharing her trigger is her vulnerable attempt at connection. Okay. It's her vulnerable attempt at connection when she shares her trigger, her pain. 
And if I can keep that in mind, if I'm in, inside of my window of tolerance, if I'm in a good place, I got to meet that vulnerability. I got to do it no matter what, if I'm relationally, got to meet that vulnerability. So how am I going to meet that vulnerability? I'm going to meet it with curiosity because I like, I felt for you, brother, when you're like, when you did that water burger thing, when you were talking about it and you said, how'd that make you feel? I'm like, dude, that's scary. Are you sure you're going to go there? That's going to be, that's going to be heavy, but you're just meeting your partner. You're meeting your partner in vulnerability. And so often we get it confused that because my partner's sharing her pain, she's not being vulnerable. She's trying to hurt me. No, she's not. That is a level of vulnerability. She's sharing up hurt and you could hurt her more by attacking her through defense or by walling off through just shutting down. So or minimizing, right? Add that one in there. The other thing I'll add, the repetitions, the more repetitions you can get in this area and the stronger the relationship will get. It's yeah. just like lifting weights. The more repetitions you get in being curious about your wife's emotion. Yeah. It's you, you start burning. It's painful, but it's, it only makes it stronger. Yeah. I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap out with a couple of thoughts. I have Then Please add anything that you want to say what men have in common for the men that can actually sit there with their partner is to recognize there's not something to fix. There's not something that I need to do to, to handle my partner's emotions. What I need to be present for is her sharing her emotions and understanding and getting to know deeply what that was like for her. There's no fixing to be done. We started off with why does my partner keep bringing this up over and over again, the same thing. It's because I'm not doing that. I'm not saying if you nail it, that means you're only going to have one, two, three times where they bring it up. But if you're into this months and years and your partner is still bringing this up, means you haven't heard them. You're not hearing. You don't understand what they're going through. Don't give up. Don't stop. Just get curious and recognize that's, that is possible. And if I might add, Luke, just to, mm-hmm. as we're closing this out, the steering them part is important. Just because you hear them once doesn't mean they're not going to want to be heard again. Doesn't mean the pain's going to come back. And this curiosity part, we talked about this earlier before the podcast is really like an ED out of the hundred miles, right? Me running a hundred miles, I'll talk to this really, really briefly, but as you're running a hundred miles, you have to be very curious about what your own self and body is going through. And you have to be paying attention. What do I need? How do I feel? What's going on? Is that a burning in my foot? Do I feel cramps coming on? Are my fingers swelling up? What does that mean? How is this going to affect it? What do I actually need to take in? And you have to be curious about yourself. because I know it's about yourself, but you're paying attention to all these different things going on. You have to be asking yourself, what is this pain actually telling me? And you have to dig into the deep, dark thoughts that are going on that can be scary. I am not good enough. I am not able to overcome. And when you're in that conversation with your wife, those thoughts will come up. I'm not good enough for her, I totally destroyed her. And you have to really change that perspective and be like, all right, what's this actually telling me? It's not true, right? In order to stay there and be curious about your wife, you actually have to look at her and know and not take it on yourself. You have to be curious about her, what's she going through? What does she need? And how do I know what she needs? Did you ask her? You can't assume that she wants you to just go straight to acknowledge validate and make sure she may have more to share or she just may, I just need you to hear me. I don't need you to do ABR. I just need you to listen to me. Sometimes that's the case. Don't just assume one way is the best way, but be open to listening and being curious will get you further than most anything else. It's a long race. Hey, thanks for hanging out today. Appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thanks Luke. All right. All right, everybody. Good to catch up with you. We'll talk to you at another time. Take care. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If this is something that you connected with, I'd love to meet with you more and talk about it. So what you can do is go to choosecoveryservices.com or check the show notes. And there, what we can do is set up a quick conversation to meet. Thanks so much for listening to Beyond the Facade, where we unmask the authentic self.